There are a couple of things that I want to touch on this morning. And one of them is that I've made a major discovery with regard to Matthew Franklin Whittier's legacy. Um, it came about through his character, Caleb Leathers. And there's one of these entries in which I sheepishly admit that I was wrong about Caleb Leathers in the Portland transcript. We're talking 1849 to 1855, I think. And then I realized that, no, that actually was him. And later I was able to prove it. So Caleb Leathers was supposed to be a farmer in uh, New Hampshire. And uh, he was supposed to be a loco foco, which was not actually Matthew's politics. And there were a number of things that, you know, didn't quite look like Matthew in terms of the character. And he would always set up a character when he wrote into the paper with the series. But it was him. And uh, Caleb Leathers is a philosopher. He's supposed to be a rustic philosopher. And the truth of the matter is that Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, had been living in Portland to help raise his third daughter, even though he was estranged from his second wife, an arranged marriage. And then at some point, he apparently bought a farm or rented a farm or was living on a farm, apparently, in New Hampshire. So he was kind of a, a gentleman farmer, you know, but he wrote in a persona as though he was a philosopher farmer. Well, that was Caleb Leathers. But at one point in 1855, Caleb Leathers quotes four lines of poetry from somebody named initials K.N. Pepper, like Cayenne Pepper. And I immediately recognized it as Matthew's own Ethan Spike style. And there were a lot of imitators, but I, but I thought to myself, no, nah, that's him. And it was also the way he introduced it. Because he had a habit of, he's in one persona and he praises one of his other personas, you know, uh, behind the scenes. So I said, oh, he's done that before. So that's Matthew. So I looked up K.N. Pepper, and this happened dozens of times, seems like, that I would recognize something as Matthew Franklin Whittier's work, and I'd look it up, and lo and behold, it was attributed to somebody else. It happened so often because, as I've said, A, Matthew was so incredibly good, and B, he kept hidden. So that's, excuse me, that's the perfect storm, the recipe for being either plagiarized or your work being misattributed. So that happened again, and uh, it was somebody, uh, let's see, James Morris, James W. Morris, I believe, that was credited with this work. He put out a book, uh, copyright 1858, published in 1859. But uh, what had actually happened, I finally traced it down. Matthew had been submitting basically an Ethan Spike character who was supposed to be a great poet, see? Um, and uh, he was basically Ethan Spike in verse. And I think it was an answer to James Russell Lowell, because the history of that is pretty interesting. In early 1846, Matthew was submitting some very edgy uh, pieces. He, he, when he first started his Ethan Spike series, it was, at that time, was anti-war, was against the Mexican-American War, and it was published in the radical Boston chronotype. And uh, after two or three or four of those pieces, James Russell Lowell started imitating him with his Hosea Bigelow character. And then Matthew, as Ethan Spike responded, incorporated that into Ethan Spike and so on. But James Russell Lowell was making an imitation, was imitating Ethan Spike. Well, James Russell Lowell later on was apparently a pretty he heavy regular contributor to the Knickerbocker in New York as well as uh, somebody that I think Matthew very much admired, which was Washington Irving. So for both reasons, because he was pleased to be publishing in the same paper, prestigious journal, I think, at that time, um, as Washington Irving, I think he also wanted to show that he could write in that style, in verse, better than James Russell Lowell could, because Hosea Bigelow wrote verse, if I'm not mistaken. So I think he had both motives there. But uh, this K.N. Pepper started in 1853, if I'm not mistaken, in the Knickerbocker and continued until 1856 when this person, James W. Morris, published this book. Well, apparently what happened, it's not that James W. Morris plagiarized him per se, but if you read the preface, 
because see, Matthew takes two personas in this. It's, a, it's an interesting premise. But Matthew is writing as P. Pepper Pod, P-O-D-D. And that's a typical pseudonym for Matthew. Um, if you look at the pseudonyms and the characters that Matthew adopted, there's, I haven't counted them because I didn't plan on going into so much depth today on this, but maybe 20, 25 times that Matthew has taken variations on his childhood nickname, Peter Pumpkin, which is something I've extrapolated. Uh, so now to call himself P. Pepper Pod, which P no doubt stood for Peter, uh, is just a variation on his childhood nickname. So this is P. Pepper Pod is this person uh, from the country, but he, he occasionally makes spelling errors, but basically he's not too terribly ignorant. And he is introducing this rustic character, K.N. Pepper, the poet. And K.N. Pepper is really, this is Matthew's satire on, you know, poetry. You see, it's, it's satire on popular poetry, and he would typically do this. So the first two poems are just kind of generic. The first one is a parody of uh, a genre that you see in the newspapers very often in the literary newspapers, like the Portland Transcript would be, you know, the, the, uh, the eagle fights the, you know, wild boar or whatever it was, you know. You see this kind of, it's just like Facebook, you know, you see this stuff on Facebook all the time. So it's, he was making a parody of that. He has a, a, a 60 foot snake killing an alligator. So, you know, uh, in this ignorant style of verse. And then the next one is a bird on a fence. See, well, it's just, you know, ludicrous parodies. But then once Matthew has finished poking fun at a particular trend, he then starts secretly embedding serious material and his own personal autobiography in the same material, see? And everybody's supposed to take it as a joke, but it's only a joke on the surface level. You know, underneath it isn't. And I can show where he wrote a parody, for example, about the Greek slave, the statue, Hiram Powers' Greek slave. He wrote about that seriously as a trunk for the carpet bag. I've shared some of the a trunk material before. But then as K.N. Pepper, he writes in this ignorant style, same thing about the same statue. See, so you've got the serious Matthew and the you know, ignorant character running parallel in two different newspapers under two different pseudonyms. I think it's pretty interesting. Well, I've got all this antiquarian material coming, all the books, including the one that Morris, I think Jacques Maurice is the pseudonym he took. What, what happened with that was Matthew apparently had a young admirer who had enough money to uh, publish a book. This young admirer of his, a fan, had offered to publish a book, and the deal that they struck was that there would be the K.N. Pepper poems published intact, and then there would be this fellow, James Morris's own ostensibly humorous essays, which are kind of mildly humorous as tributes. And the preface by P. Pepper Pod would make it clear what the breakdown was. Well, apparently librarians or historians looking at this never bothered to read the preface and figure out that he's saying in black and white, you know, this is my young friend's work. This is my this is my friend, you know, uh, K.N. Pepper's work. So they attributed the whole blasted thing to this James Morris, who was just probably a young kid and was a competent writer, one of many that Matthew was mentoring, I think. But, uh, you know, not the artist that Matthew was, you know. Well, this, this attribution thing is frustrating for me because it's so obvious to me. You know, you look at it, it's right there in the preface. He says what they're doing, that it's not all by this person, you know, and they just didn't bother to look. Well, something very similar happened with a book that was published anonymously by Matthew in 1855 called The Rag Picker or Bound and Free, which I have one, well, I think it's probably extremely rare, antiquarian copy here. Um, there's an unsigned um, you know, unattributed dedication to Matthew's younger sister, Elizabeth Whittier, in the front. It's a uh, very strong social commentary. Uh, the last half of it is anti-slavery, including the Underground Railroad. There's no possible way that the librarians 
assignment of uh, George Pickering Burnham could be correct. I just looked at my email a little while ago. I must have written 20 or 25 librarians trying to get somebody to take my part and straighten this out. And I couldn't get anybody. You know, they were all very polite, but nobody would step forward and dare challenge the status quo. And uh, this is an obvious one. You know, this, this one and the one I just talked about with uh, James W. Morris, these are obvious mistakes. And yet trying to get the system to change one of these things. Well, along comes Academia EDU four months ago. It was in April, almost four months ago to the day. Matter of fact, it was four months ago to the day yesterday. And the call had gone out from them to all of the subscribers of Academia EDU to submit a, a paper no longer than 1,600 words. Um, and I jumped on it, and in one day, I wrote a 1,600-word paper about this very thing, about the rag picker bound and free and the mistaken attribution of George Pickering Burnham. I've gone into all this before. If anybody's new here, George Burnham was one of Matthew Franklin Whittier's longtime plagiarists. Matthew had pissed him off by panning one of his books, which was actually based on a story Matthew had written. And uh, apparently he retaliated two months after the rag picker was published in October of 1855. He pulled a very interesting scam. He had money. So he bought a book distributor, a book publisher called Fetterhen and Company. And he made it Burnham Fetterhen and Company. And he advertised the books that he had for sale, including the rag picker, and he put his name on it as the author. <laughs> you know, and then he got a couple local newspapers to sign off on it and write articles saying, oh, at last the anonymous author of the rag picker has been discovered. It's George Burnham. Well, it didn't fly, but somebody some historian got hold of it and included it in a short biography of Burnham and then some bibliography in 1956 or thereabouts got hold of it and listed as one of George Burnham's productions, The Rag Picker. And then a modern librarian got hold of that and penciled Burnham's name in the cover and then they digitized that and sent it to all the libraries in the world. And then the uh, print on demand People got hold of that and put Burnham's name on the cover. And the whole thing is an obvious, obvious mistake, right? Well, anyway, I wrote all that up, but I got it into 1,600 words, which wasn't easy. And uh, I waited and I waited. And they have a page where you could check and see the progress of your submission. And it said expect one to two weeks. And I waited and waited. And finally, not too long ago, I checked it and it said your submission is taking longer than expected. Please be patient. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, there kind of on top of it. Well, just yesterday it did get published. And oh boy, you know, um, let's see, I wrote down the figures. As of now, the last time I checked, this is like almost five in the morning on the 11th. As of the last time I checked, 49 people, it said, had looked at my profile. Apparently the software isn't set up yet to tell you how many people are looking at papers, because this is a new procedure they've set up. And so I don't know how many people have actually looked at the manuscript or read the paper, but 49 people looked at my profile. Now, here's the thing. I figured out that the way academia works, they are much more likely to get excited about some little, I'll say the word, picky thing, some little discovery. A big discovery throws them all into denial. They can't deal with it. They can't deal with the fact that Matthew and Abby wrote A Christmas Carol. They can't deal with the fact that Edgar Allan Poe was not the author of The Raven, that Matthew was the sole author of that poem, and of Annabelle Lee as well, as I talked about in my last entry. They can't deal with that. They just kick it into denial. Or if anybody believes it, they sure as heck aren't going to say anything. You know. Well, I tricked them, I'm afraid. I, I didn't... Well... Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Let's put it that way. But I realized that they're much more likely to respond to a little picky thing that's obvious than they are to a big thing, even if that's also just as obvious, you know. So I said, well, let's write a paper about something they can wrap their minds around, something they can deal with, and not something that they'll go into denial over, see. Start small instead of big. And, you know, sometimes you can break through a wall by just like being like the Hulk and, you know, 
just bashing through it, but sometimes you can make yourself small and slip through, see? So what's happened is, let me read a couple of the comments. There's two comments already on this thing because I opened it up for a discussion. The first one is, curious, intriguing world of scams within scams. I want to know more about this literary Wild West. Who are these men who steal works and claim authorship? And why all the pseudonyms in the first instance? How many voices did Matthew Franklin Whittier require to express himself? When curiosity sets in so strongly, one can be sure that the article by Stephen Sacalarius is effective. I think this was a, a reviewer, reviewer's comment. Explore more, Stephen. Describe more. <laughs> I can imagine your joy in discovering this world, your world of historical investigative journalism. Bring it forth. Oh, <laughs> he has no idea. And then the second one is, I've already cited, I mean, I think he means after reading the, the paper, I've already cited this important corrective to America's early literary history, which makes a strong case that one of the classic works of slavery slash benevolent empire fiction was penned by John Greenleaf Whittier's younger brother, Matthew Franklin, not George P. Burnham. It worked. I got him. <laughs> they, but then they looked at the profile and they realized that this thing, he's already, he's already uh, cited it. You know, what's he going to do? Take his citation back? And the other says, bring it forth. Well, I have brought it forth. And if you look at the profile, you see that this crazy nutcase is claiming that he is the reincarnation of Matthew, that Matthew and Abby actually were the original authors of A Christmas Carol, that after her death, Matthew wrote The Raven and Annabelle Lee in tribute to her and not Edgar Allan Poe. They have no idea. So what do they do when they get to the profile? I suppose they feel tricked. Well, it's their own blasted fault, you know, uh, for not listening to me in the first place. You know, I had to do that. And uh, but what do they do? Do they take it all back? Does he erase his citation? Does the guy say, don't bring it forth? <laughs> no, you know, so 49 people so far have looked at that. Well, some 35 looked at my paper about uh, Margaret Fuller a week or two back, and then nobody wrote me or said anything about it, see? Now, I watched a program that's just put out by Showtime about UFOs, and it's current. I watched it a couple days ago, most of it. And uh, there's somebody compared the academic response to UFOs as like the Fight Club, which I'm not really familiar with that movie, but the gist of it is the first rule of the Fight Club was that nobody ever says anything about the Fight Club. In other words, it's strictly secrecy. So if 35 people read my paper about Margaret Fuller and nobody says anything, and then 49 people look at my profile after reading this paper, which did get published after four months delay, and nobody says anything, you know, I mean, it's beginning to look kind of like the Fight Club. You know, what's going on out there? You know, I mean, a lot of people looked at my have looked at my papers about Poe and Charles Dickens, too. And nobody wants to talk about it. Matter of fact, there's there's at least two or three uh, scholars with whom I won't name for their own safety, who have been willing to dialogue with me. But they kind of petered out at some point. They realized the magnitude of the thing. And they and it's like, no, this is dangerous. I'm out of here. You know, so <laughs> I, I, excuse me, at the very least, I know careers are at stake. I won't say that anything bigger than that is at stake, but definitely careers are at stake. People could definitely lose their jobs if they come out and champion what I've discovered. And uh, of course, I'm immune to that, at least, because uh, I have no status. I have no job. I have no uh, part of academia, per se. Uh, I'm a complete outsider. And so there's two things I've said, and that's that I could not do this work if I was in academia. It had to be done by somebody outside the system. And secondly, the only way I could ever have discovered this is by reincarnation research, you know, and really by being Matthew's own reincarnation who has come back to set the matter straight. Otherwise, nobody's ever found this stuff, see, and nobody ever could discover this stuff without that because partly because I can feel it, partly because I've done 11 years of serious scholastic research, but partly because Matthew himself left these clues. 
I never would have found K. N. Pepper had not Matthew, as Caleb Leathers, quoted four lines in his typical style of, you know, praising K. N. Pepper as though it was somebody else, you know. And unless I had recognized that in Caleb Leathers, I never would have found K. N. Pepper because I can't read all of these things, you know, it would take a lifetime to read all of this material. So Matthew left his own clues, and I've been following those, that breadcrumb trail of clues that he left, see? Well, it's very unlikely that anybody else would ever have found it. For one thing, Matthew had been so badly marginalized on top of hiding so assiduously, you know, that nobody ever, ever guessed it. They all thought he was just a hack writer who wrote, you know, as one of the official, unofficial Woody, our biographer, said, you know, wrote this Ethan Spike, but it wasn't worth the trouble of looking up. And it proved incontestably that there's only one genius born in a family. That was uh, Kennedy, I believe, William Sloan Kennedy. So everybody believed it, and nobody bothered to look it up, and nobody took it seriously. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that Matthew kept Ethan Spike uh, quiet also, and was only outed as Ethan Spike in 1857. Had that not happened, nobody would have found anything. I never would have found it. Nobody ever would have guessed that Matthew was the author of these things. See? So you really do have a dark planet circling the 19th century literary skies, this dark horse. And he's a major horse. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he's, a, he's a major author. See, this is the thing people don't want to admit, that there's a major author of the 19th century that they've all missed. And I sympathize with that. You know, but these guys think that this particular discovery that I've revealed about the real authorship of the rag picker is a major discovery. This is this is just scratching the surface of Matthew Franklin Whittier's legacy, just the barest, easiest thing to prove. See, so can I lead them into it from the small thing instead of hitting them with the big things? You know, I don't know. But uh, it certainly seems like it has a chance. I'll be curious to see what happens from this point on. I think there's shocked silence, you know, and then we'll see. So, um, again, I have all the antiquarian volumes with the exception of one that just introduces, you know, that K.N. Pepper is coming. But all of the ones that have his work, I've got original antiquarian copies on the way coming in the mail. And when I get them all in, I'll go through some of this. The, the material is a screen, you know. It's, I mean, Matthew had, at this point, been writing Ethan Spike since 1846, or, you know, what, seven, eight years. Um, and he'd been writing in this style far earlier, starting with Joe Strickland um, in a couple different papers, and then Enoch Timbertoes in the uh, New York Constellation, and then Joshua Greening in uh, Yankee Doodle, and then Jedediah Simpkins in the Boston Weekly Museum. So he'd written this kind of character and other ones too that I haven't mentioned uh, for years and years. And he got extremely good at it, at writing in ignorant, rustic, horrible spelling with hidden undertones, see? <laughs> with deep philosophy as the, as the underpinning of the thing. Uh, it's, it's brilliant stuff. And it's Matthew clowning because he wasn't taken seriously, because he was just the little brother of the great poet. Nobody took him seriously. He hid himself under this self-deprecating humor and joked and ridiculed his own character when he said he was a genus, G-E-N-U-S-C. -E he, he ridiculed his own character's genius. But it was a work of genius in itself, of humorous genius with a deep philosophical underpinning to it. <laughs> so it's, it's, to me, to me, it's really fascinating. I hope it will be to somebody else. And uh, I will sign off on this one. And then if I don't find something else that I really feel I must hold forth about, I'll wait until I get all the antiquarian volumes in and I'll read you a little bit of K.N. Pepper.